Well, brothers and sisters, we're um, we're very pleased to have Brother Barson with us today. Um, I'm going to have him introduce a little bit about his assignment at church headquarters, because I think it's important for you to hear from him some of the responsibilities that the Board of Education has required of him in his position. Um, but I want to talk to you specifically to, or introduce the, the man, Brad Barson, because I've had the chance to work with Brad. I have been so impressed with the way that Brother Barson has keenly desired to serve the Lord and to serve you in the world. He asks a lot of questions. He asks, um, it, it, there, will, there will be several times when I'll be working and I'll get a ping from Brad that just says, hey, can I pick your bane or can I, can I run this by you? He wants to find a way to help you as teachers to have the right products, the right message, the right training necessary because he recognizes and we all recognize that we can all do better. And it's his job to make us better, um, at least the product wise. And so one of the cool things about having Brad here today is, is that he is connected to what the, the Board of Education is asking of us as teachers and what, what the new push is for us with teaching in the Savior's way. And he comes with an extensive background of, of teaching with BYU-Idaho and uh, working at BYU-Idaho professionally with training their online teachers. And then we stole them at the at church headquarters to be able to be a part of our, our programming. So, uh, Brad, thank you for joining us tonight. We're really, really grateful that you were able to, to spend some time. For all the, uh, this is a little bit of a sacrifice for him and his family because his wife is in the Tabernacle Choir. And so they had to rearrange some things so that he would able, was able to, to join us. Um, so grateful that you were able to make that work. But turn the time over to you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, let's see here. I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. Okay. Uh, yes. What? Wow. What an introduction. Uh, thanks, Brother Goldthard. I really appreciate that. Um, I will introduce a little bit about myself and what I do. Uh, but first, I wanted to just share a, a brief outline tonight of what what the presentation will be about. So, a short introduction to me. Uh, and then we'll dive into a narrative that I wrote about what teacher presence is. And then we'll discuss some principles and practices surrounding establishing teacher presence. And then we'll get a chance to actually practice applying what we just learned in some scenarios. If we have time, I have two, but if not, we'll just do one. And we'll have the time for Q&A at the end. Um, but I am Brad Barson. Uh, I grew up in uh, Boise, Idaho. And uh, I am a child of uh, music. What that means is my family are all musicians. My parents are both music educators. And I went to BYU-Idaho as a student back in the day to thinking I was going to be a music educator, a choir teacher, until my wife said she wanted nine kids. And then we don't make enough money for that as a choir teacher. <laughs> so here I am. I'm now in uh, a, an online learning manager and got my master's degree in learning technology and instructional design at Utah State. So go Aggie. Uh, and my first uh, job in my career was, as uh, Brother Goldhart mentioned, uh, an online training coordinator in the BYU-Idaho online learning program. And so essentially what I did was I, uh, the team that I was with oversaw the, the first new teacher training for brand new teachers at BYU Idaho and then Pathway Worldwide, and then oversaw their continuing development as teachers uh, for, for the program at BYU Idaho. Very fulfilling job. I love that. Until uh, COVID hit and seminaries and institutes realized, oh my goodness, we need to be able to do religious education online uh, and do it differently than we have been. And so they took three of us from BYU Idaho and uh, uh, had the fortunate blessing of working with Brother Goldhart uh, for the last several years and, and helping to, to build a, a new online program. Um, so specifically, all I do is uh, build stuff, is what I feel like. I'm a tinkerer for teachers. <laughs> so some of the products that you'll see coming from brother, down the line through Brother Goldhart are things that I will have built. And yes, as Brother Goldhart said, is they're meant to help you understand more about how you can uh, through the online medium, help students uh, understand and rely upon the atonement of Jesus Christ and um, 
and learn more about his gospel and strengthen their testimonies. Uh, this is my family and like wife, uh, like Mike mentioned, my wife's in the Todd America choir. So there she is down in the bottom, right? So now you have someone to look for if you didn't before. Music and spoken word. She's the beautiful one on the far left. Uh, who's at the very end of the choir. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce this narrative. To introduce the topic of uh, principles of teacher presence, especially in the online setting, I've just prepared a, a small story to share. So as I read it, I want you to think of this. I'm gonna ask this question. What teacher practices do you see or what teacher practices do you not see happening? Okay, here we go. So imagine it's your first day of high school uh, as a student. You have a lot of feelings happening all at once. Perhaps you're excited and nervous, maybe even a little overwhelmed with this new adventure that's ahead of you. You are not sure what to expect, but you hope you'll be successful. Once you get to the school, you walk up to the front doors and give them a good pull, but the doors are locked. Now you are nervous and frustrated because as you look around, it appears that everybody else knows what's going on. You walk around the perimeter of the school and finally find an open door and enter the school. You find your classroom, but the lights are out and nobody is in the room. You were looking forward to class, but now you're confused. You wonder where the teacher is and where to sit. You discover that somebody left the class syllabus for students to find and read on their own. You would like to be greeted by the teacher and be told what to expect about the class experience, but so far it is hard to tell what either will be like. So the scene described above may seem so unlikely that it's hard to imagine that would happen in the real world, but unfortunately this often happens to online students. Uh, once they're enrolled in an online class, they often, it's unclear to them what the student should be doing first and what the role of the teacher is in the online learning experience. It's like they walked into a room with the door locked and the lights turned off. So counterpoint, imagine this. You walk into the right into the school through unlocked doors underneath the banner that says, welcome new students. When you arrive at your classroom, you're greeted with a smile from your teacher. She calls you by name and welcomes you to class saying, it's good to see you. She, sends, she hands you the class syllabus with instruction to read the first page letting you know that class will start in five minutes. You sit down and find your new textbook on your desk. You know what is expected of you right away and you feel welcome, more at ease and excited to learn. Okay, so let's take a moment. Um, feel free to hop off mic. Um, I can see most of you uh, and I'll ask these questions. We'll have a little discussion. What did the first scenario fail to do in relation to the teacher being present? Or in other words, what gaps do you see in the experience when considering teacher presence? Who's got a thought about that? Yeah, Sister Crouch, go ahead. Uh, no one reached out in advance to like then explain, here's when we're meeting or here's where Canvas is, here's how you log in, here's just all that info before that you need and I totally get that because I was like a pathway student and then I'm a BYU I graduate and um and I had teachers that were so good at that sending you an email in advance and so you knew everything beforehand and then other teachers that you kind of went do I have a teacher for this class <laughs> exactly yeah so can I tell you a secret the most important, the most crucial time of the semester or or the class is actually before the semester even begins. Uh, I, and I know there's there's logistical reasons about sometimes how it's hard to contact teachers, but as much as or students, but as much as you can, uh, letting them know beforehand what to expect before class begins is so crucial for this for the very reason that is articulated in this metaphor. What are some other things that we saw? Yeah, Sister Pulse. Um, just an absence of the teacher in the first scenario, there was no teacher in that empty room. The, the student had no even idea maybe of where to find the teacher. And I think when we're online, it's easy to feel like we're anonymous or we're invisible. 
unless we're on a Zoom class, obviously. But when when they do their online modules, it's it's a, it takes a little more effort to reach out and let them know we are here. So that was my very good, very good. Yeah, Canvas can sometimes feel like you're walking into a black hole um, unless there is a signpost <laughs> or or an avatar of you or something saying, "Hey, I'm here. You're you're safe. Everything's welcome." Uh, yes, one last comment, Mr. Crash. Go ahead. There we go. Um, I was going to say that. Um, yeah, I think that we have to remember too that just as as familiar as I am with Canvas doesn't mean everybody is, and a lot of people that's so intimidating to you know they haven't had that experience of online learning. This may be their very first one. This may be their first semester of Pathway, and so that whole idea. I know, like I had students that got confused because apparently the portal where they um, log in for Canvas Pathway is not the same portal where they log into Pathway for their religion class. And so I had a few that that was confusing to them. Wait a minute, am I supposed to, do, you know, why don't I see that here? And, and they had to learn that, yeah, there's two different logins. Yep, the teacher is the first line of support for helping students to navigate some of those system things that are kind of annoying, like for the pathway student in particular, having two logins to two different instances of Canvas, that can be hard. But yeah, you teachers the, on the front lines helping them. Very good. Okay, so the second question, what did the second scenario succeed in doing that the first scenario failed to do? Uh, let's hear from, from some other people too. I love silence. That just means the spirit is working on you. Well, the teacher greeted them, the student. Uh, the book was ready on the desk. Um, they, the things worked the way that the student would be, you would feel to be normal, was able to walk directly to the class. Uh, before they weren't able to, they had to find a back way in. Um, so, you know, things kind of worked as, you know, a logical progression, was able to enter the building, was able to find the classroom, was greeted, had the have all the materials ready to go uh, on the desk. So. Fabulous. Yeah, that's an excellent summary. The, the teacher was there. The, they knew what they were supposed to be doing um they were greeted they knew their name so I, I don't know if you caught that but they said welcome and they say your name so you're not just the nameless face they worked ahead of time mr erickson what do you thought i thought one of the big things that i noticed was the direction they knew where to go they weren't searching for what room to go to they already knew what room to go to and with um online that's a very hard thing is to know even where to start. Interesting observation. To know what, what location to go to. Yeah, very good. And this is related to the other comment. Sometimes the system doesn't really lend itself to make sense about where the student should be going. And so as much as possible, the teacher can help mitigate that. Understanding sometimes your limitations. Yeah, very good. Okay, so this is a uh, rhetorical as we move transition to the next slide, this question, but um, it's a primer for what's next. What can you as an online teacher do to help your online learners have an experience more like the second scenario and unlike the first scenario? Which we're gonna dive into right now. So let's talk about what we can do to virtually speaking, turn on the light and open the door. And if you would like to take notes, now would be the time. <laughs> because we are going to be, like I said, analyzing some scenarios so that we can use some of these ideas uh, as we apply them later. Okay, so you are the group, a group of teachers who are seeing something that uh, before the rest of the world will see it. So a document that uh, will be published very shortly uh, for use for online teachers and seminars and institutes is called the Guidelines for Successful Online Teaching. Uh, it's not published yet. Um, but uh, since I wrote it, <laughs> you can see some of the elements that I thought would be most relevant for what does it mean to establish teaching presence and what are some practices that I can do. 
So I look forward to that. Um, Brother Goldhart will send it to you once it becomes available. Um, but here, I'll just walk you through some of these practices. So the first one is posting a weekly update for learners. Uh, this seems natural in a face-to-face -face classroom. Hey, this week we're gonna be talking about this. Uh, here's some things to look forward to. Here's some things as I've taught this class uh, to watch out for. Um, this is an opportunity for you to provide feedback on the previous week uh, stuff. So if, you, if you've seen some misconceptions or you saw some a uh, bunch of the class members did something really well, this is an opportunity for you to provide feedback as well as help to feed forward. A, a chance for you to generate some excitement about the content. Uh, even bear your testimony about principles that will be coming uh, in the lesson as well to help prime the pump, get them excited for it. Also, in relation to teacher presence, this is one of the few places when you post an announcement specifically in an, in your Canvas course where you can put your fingerprints in the course somewhere. They, they'll say, oh, Brother Barson posted an announcement. I better go and look at that. Oh, he's present in the course. In the absence of that, um, assuming that the students access the Canvas course, it doesn't look like the lights are on and the doors are locked if the teacher's not there. So posting a weekly update for learners is, is crucially, uh, is crucial. The next, uh, the next practice, participate in the discussion boards. So in SNI, Seminaries and Institutes, there, there are two kinds of discussion boards that are used. One is an optional discussion board and the other is a required discussion board. So I don't know what, what um, classes y'all teach, but uh, you'll probably have one or the other. An optional discussion board is just that. Um, no one's really required to post in there, not even the teacher. It's really just there as a place for people to kind of collaborate and post uh, if they have questions or issues or even just connect if they want to. Um, when I taught, I had an optional discussion uh, at BYU-Idaho, and I would use that as a place to help connect students that have conversations outside of what uh, the pathway class was, was doing. So I, for example, uh, Thanksgiving is coming up and I often taught in the fall. Um, and I, uh, for a time, taught students in the United States. So, so with Thanksgiving coming up, I would say, hey, here's, let's take this opportunity and post your favorite recipes or your favorite memories regarding Thanksgiving so we can share the class. Um, it's important to help establish community outside of the remote gathering too. And another way you can do that is online in the LMS course by using a discussion board like that. That's an optional discussion board. A required discussion is something that's part of the curriculum where the students are required as part of the activities to post something. And if that's the case, uh, the teacher should be in there too. They should be commenting on the student's post, offering uh, validating feedback, corrective feedback, uh, helping to connect students to other others' posts because sometimes uh, they don't read each other's posts, even though they're right there. Um, the teacher can be a great facilitator of the discussion. And again, that's a place, one of the few places where a teacher can put their fingerprints um, within the online course. Okay, the next practice is to this somewhat of a no-brainer in my mind, but maybe not in some others, but actually access, accessing the course. The, the principle here is that the online teacher could log into Canvas for each day that their learners do. So, uh, so in some more remote parts of the world, sometimes students can only access like two days a week, then that's fine. The teacher shouldn't be expected to be in there five days a week. Just be in there two days a week. Here in North America, it's not common that they'd be there, that students would be in the course between four and six days a week. So the teacher should be in there four to six days a week. Um, at BYU Idaho, I was in a position where I could help mentor teachers and often the low performing teachers uh, were just simply not in the course. Uh, they weren't helping students. They weren't monitoring what they were doing. They weren't creating activities or um, participating in the activities either. And students noticed that the teacher wasn't there. Um, in worst case scenarios, they were gone on vacation for weeks and didn't tell anybody until, until we noticed that. And, and students noticed that. So if we care about the student experience, we will also access the CAMS course as often as they do. Next principle. Uh, well, there's two, these two are kind of together, but grading activities or assignments and providing activity feedback. So some of your courses currently are not necessarily designed with uh, graded activities in them, and that's okay. So if that's the case, try to figure out ways that you can apply this principle in your case, even if you may not have officially graded activities, right? Um, I'm thinking primarily of seminary. It's really just participatory. 
So just take this for what it is and see how we can apply principles. But um, I think at least one assignment per week per learner should get well-written personalized feedback. Um, so what I would do uh, when I taught at BYU Idaho is if there's an activity or assignment I, or assignment, I would make sure that I um, picked out something from what they wrote and made a specific comment about that in my feedback so that they knew that I read their submission. If it's just great job, good work, they can see right through that. And they know that it's not sincere. Um, sometimes I would even make invitations say, hey, I noticed this uh, next week. Will, will you think about this principle and then incorporate that into, into your response? Because um, then that also tells them, oh, uh, he's inspiring me to have more diligent learning here too. So making invitations and feedback is really crucial. If you're not doing those things, uh, they, again, they notice that you're not being present in the course like you should. Okay, the last one is, uh, I need to clarify a little bit. So respond to learner questions within 24 hours. What this doesn't say is solve learner questions or issues within 24 hours. Um, that's not what is expected. But really what they're doing, if a student has a question or an issue and they're submitting it to you um, for, for help, if you don't respond within two or three days, they're gonna be wondering what happened. But if you simply reply back and say, oh, thank you so much, uh, Rob or Julie or whatever, um, I will work as, as uh, diligent as I can to find an answer to this question. That's all they need. They just need to know that you heard uh, what they were saying and that as you work to help resolve their question or their issue. That's all that. So respond to questions within a day, but not necessarily resolve. Okay, so those are some uh, practical practices, things you can actually do. But now let's tie that into teaching in the Savior's way. Because this is our official, if you want to think about it, our teaching manual for teaching within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So let's review a little bit. Which teaching the Savior's Way principles do the guidelines for successful online teaching fit within? Um, so focus on Jesus Christ uh, through feedback and through announcements, through these discussions, through personal emails. Those are opportunities for you to bear testimony of Jesus Christ to, to redirect whatever the conversation is to the Savior Jesus Christ. These are incredible. All of these practices you can use to help the class and your student focus on Jesus Christ. Loving those that you teach. If, if you're not aware of what they're doing in their campus experience, um, and you're relying solely on the remote gathering to get to know your students, I think you're missing a really important part of um, being able to love your your students because they will share information you'll glean some insight in, into what they're who they are and what they're doing as you engage in the canvas experience teaching by the spirit the more informed you are about your learners and the things that they're talking about uh the things that they have worries about they have anxieties about the spirit will be able to work more fully through you as with the more information you have so if, if we're not using the Canvas experience and relying solely on the remote gathering experience to help understand our learners, then we're missing a crucial part of that. Teacher doctrine. Uh, some of these teacher presence things, unless someone can think of a, a really good one, I didn't really have too many for this one because the curriculum a lot of the times takes care of that as far as teacher presence. But inviting diligent learning, I touched on this a little bit already. Uh, you have opportunities to extend invitations through announcements, through the discussion board, through, through grades and feedback, uh, to invite them to take responsibility for their own learning or invite them to do something deeper that they may not have done. So all of these teacher practices that we've seen, uh, we can see, uh, love those you teach, respond to learner questions. I mean, that could fit in any number of these. Um, Lovely those teaching by the spirit, responding to questions can seem like a like an administrative task, but maybe they have a question that actually deals with the foundation of their testimony. Uh, an opportunity to teach them through through the Canvas medium. Hope we can do so and respond with love uh, and focus on the Savior and do so with the Spirit. There's an important connection there too as well. Okay. So this is the last part of the knowledge step, of the note-taking step, and then we'll get into the application step. A crucial part uh, of teacher presence is not only what we do, but how we sound. 
So we've been talking a lot about uh, what we can do in the online environment to be present in the online learning experience. Um, but it's not just what we do to be present, but how we do it. Uh, I'm talking about specifically what your written voice sounds like online and what your spoken words sound like. The tone of your online voice and how you interact with your online students is crucially important. So here's some tips and tricks as we introduce principles of online etiquette. Avoid using caps lock uh, or using too many exclamation points. Uh, in my opinion, as, as a representative millennial in this group, we love using exclamation points because we're generally happy folk, us millennials. But too many of them can sound like you're shouting or too enthusiastic about it. So be, be sparing on the exclamation point. The same thing with caps lock. If you've got caps lock on and, and you're typing something, it just sounds like you're shouting. We, we want to be kind and considerate and don't want to come off as rude or even aggravated for students. Uh, second, ask clarifying follow up questions to get to the heart of the real issue. So sometimes you will have questions that come your way. And sometimes there's, there is an underlying issue that the student is grappling with. And we want to be sensitive to understanding what that is uh, before we come up with a response. So asking clarifying follow-up questions politely to really understand what the student is struggling with uh, can go a long way. Uh, responding with empathy to, to that plight or to that question that they ever may be facing is really, really crucial. So always assume the best of your students and respond with empathy, asking clarifying questions to understand what the heart of the issue is. Online learning and principle number three, when we communicate asynchronously, we're not at the same time. Um, over over the internet, you've got a real advantage because you don't have to reply to them in the moment. You don't have to think so fast on your feet. You can take your time. So when responding to a student, you can read what they say, try to understand it, and think about it, and then you can write. Uh, you can write. Uh, some, sometimes what I, what I have done when they pose a question is I actually write it out and I sleep on it and I come back the next day and then I have different thoughts and I revise it and then send it out, especially if I'm a little upset because <laughs> I don't want to be reactionary to that. Um, so read first, then think, and then write. Uh, be your own proofreader. We want to make sure that we're professional too. Um, all the LOLs or the WOWs or whatever those abbreviations, or if there's uh, punctuation mistakes or uh, grammatical errors, just make sure that when we're replying back that we're being our own proofreader and being careful and professional in how we communicate to. Uh, even in seminaries and institutes, uh, that's important. And the last one would be be forgiving. Um, I mentioned this before, it's related to number two, but, but assume the best of our students. Assume uh, that they they have some struggle you may not know about, and you'll be you know, uh, you you'll be right most of the time that there's something that uh, that they they may need help with. If they submit something that is uh, according to your standard less than uh, exemplary, be forgiving. And maybe there's an opportunity for you to provide some coaching to them. Uh, maybe it's indicative of some other struggle that they're having, and they they don't need criticism. Maybe they need uh, they need someone to just listen. Uh, an SNI teacher can do that within within reason. So be forgiving when you come across those in those situations. Okay, that's the last principle or the last practice. And so now we have an opportunity for us to read some scenarios, and then we'll have a discussion about. Uh, what we could do in these scenarios to establish uh, a firmer teacher presence. Okay, so scenario number one. The class is a very active discussion board, but the teacher doesn't spend any time there. They feel like it is a waste of time. They facilitate a great remote gathering and leave gradebook feedback regarding the discussion board, but doesn't like posting on the board. Considering what we discussed about the importance of the discussion board and the teacher's participation in it, what are some practices this teacher can implement that will help establish meaningful teacher presence? Uh, feel free to just parrot it, what we did and we just talked about. But if you also have something else that you uh, have found successful or that you've seen someone else do or that Brother Goldhart, because I know he's all about this, uh, that, that Brother Goldhart has suggested you do, what would we do 
uh, what can we implement to help us be a more meaningful teacher experience? I'll give an answer. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll go with you, Mr. Cole's after that. You mentioned earlier about responding to students. And if you're not in a good place, you can wait until tomorrow morning. And you can think about whatever you're going to respond. The same thing goes for discussion boards, I found. The students don't have to answer immediately. They can think about it. And so, um, I mean, um, so that's also a good way for us to, you know, to, to kind of help in there too, that we we respond. Uh, if, some, if, if we find something that really, um, I, there have been times when students have said something and I'm going, you know, I hadn't thought about that. And even that's enough sometimes. Yeah, the discussion board can be a great place for facilitating uh, these kinds of discussions and, and helping everyone to, to grow a little bit more. That's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Mr. Cole. Yeah, I kind of had two questions along these lines that maybe you Absolutely. could help with. Um, one is um, in the seminary format, um, as I understand it, my students don't see the responses I give to them. Do they see those responses on their main page? I've heard some say they do. Or do they have to uh, change their settings to be able to see my responses? Um, I know they have to do that to be able to see if I ever email that type of thing. Um, so I have a question about that. Are they seeing? Because I don't get a lot of response back when I respond. I usually respond to each student every lesson the best that I can, but I never get responses back. I do. They're really great in our Zoom classes, but I haven't been really good. Um, knowing that they're reading my responses to them. My, my second question is um, previously when we had discussion questions within the lesson that we could interact. And right now it doesn't look like that's possible in the format that I'm using that when we have a discussion question, I write, you know, I can write an answer as I'm going through my lesson, but my students aren't going to see it. They're each gonna have their own and it, and it doesn't interact with each other. Will that ever be brought back into the, the main lesson format rather than just an optional discussion board on the side? Um, yeah, to your first question, uh, the answer is yes um, and no. So, so there isn't necessarily anything in their settings that they need to change in order to see your feedback. Um, in order for them to best your feedback, it would be best if you tell them exactly where to go so that they can read it. So if you haven't done that yet, um, I would suggest you schedule a meeting with uh, Brother Goldhart and he can tell you a really good way how to do that. Um, right on their homepage, so when they log into Canvas, um, before they even uh, go into anywhere, down in the bottom right in the student view, there's a, a, a little widget called uh, recent feedback. I think is what it's called. Okay. And what that does is it shows, oh, there's a recently graded assignment. And it actually gives a truncated version of feedback, uh, assuming that you've left it in the submission comments space in the speed grader. Um, so they won't, there is an indicator that you left feedback right there, assuming you leave the submission comments, if they're looking for it. Um, so that's, that's what I'd say. It's there, it's not necessarily super intuitive for them to find. I found great success when I make a video for my students and tell them exactly where to go. And I say, click here, click here, click here, because I just respond to all y'all. And it seems like only half of you are looking at it. I found great success with that. For your second question, um, if I understand correctly, there was in curriculum a discussion board mm -hmm. that was required. Mm -hmm. And now that discussion board has been made optional. Is that right. what you're saying? And so will that discussion board become back? I just think about that. Um, I, Brad, I can answer that one. Okay. For our area, we are creating an, an um, in the curriculum that's adapted for the South areas, we do have a required discussion board 
that, that the students are participating in. Um, if they if you choose to use the the adapted, if you're not using the adapted, you do not. Uh, that's great because my answer to that question was going to be that's a great conversation for Brother Goldheart. Because <laughs> in some instances that is uh, area specific. Yeah. Uh, Diana Dean, got a question. So so is. Is there not a way in settings for the student to get a daily email for any responses that they're getting? I get one. They can. So, uh, and is Mandy still here? Maybe she could clarify too. Um, just here. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mandy. Can. Yeah. So I'm going to say something. Validate. Uh, they can so there is a in the notification settings they should be able to set uh, a summary of recent comments that have been made for assignments or at least assignments that have been graded and they can receive that notification in an email digest so they can set that to be immediate or daily or i can't remember what the third setting is. if you'd like them to do that i i don't know what the default setting is there but you you could also create a short video that shows them hey i want you to know that uh, you can actually receive a notification that I have graded this. Here's how you do that. You can set that up. Um, if you're interested in that, Brother Goldcart could also help you with that as well. Um, okay, one last one last uh, comment uh, from Brother Harris. So um, I'm an IT guy. And so a lot of times I look at things in terms of the tool and how it's used and uh, because these are these are tools and tools can be can be modified. I in a certain sense, uh, it can be confusing trying to jump back and forth between the discussion board and the and the comments and the grading, because I do see that there's a link, uh, I guess, uh, the I guess the vertical ellipsis on the right hand side that says, well, take me to this, take me to the speed grading. The problem is, is that the speed grading doesn't take you right back. And maybe this might be, you know, beyond what you're requesting, but it sure would be great within the discussion board to be able to grade the, to grade, the, assign the point total or whatever it is there. I think that would be a lot more organic in terms of reading and grading. And so I don't have to like go back and forth and well, have I already read this before? Have I already commented on this? Have I, already, have I already given feedback? It would be great to be able to grade that directly in the board. Now I understand that you know this is this is a canvas feature not necessarily something that we but i'm it sounds like you maybe i don't know if you have a relationship with with canvas and can take feature upgrades but that would sure be handy if we're if we're going to be grading these discussions it would be nice to be able to grade it directly there i'm not saying that that's what the other students can see but as a teacher that should be something that i should i think i should have direct access to uh, that's interesting um no, I am not a vendor partner with Instructure, uh, and that's a Canvas UI UX feature that you're talking about. Um, so all I can do is commiserate. <laughs> you know, I have to say um, I'm the devil's advocate. I actually kind of love how it is that you click on your grading and then you see all of their responses in one, like you, I can see here's what they posted, here's what they commented, here's what they commented to somebody else. I like being able to see it all together when I grade it, rather than having to spin up and down the discussion board. Oh. So for me, I kind of like it that way. It's so much easier just to see every comment they've made in one in one sheet. I I, I agree. Um, it's good to, for the student. It's just that you lose context by seeing what the what the student what the student is responding to that that would be helpful to see you know hey this is this is the comment that they're talking to and this is what they're responding to so if it's already in in the i'm not saying take that away i don't like it when people take away features i would just like the feature added but so so what i do is use two tabs i hit one tab to for the speed grader and i hit one tab for the discussion i read the discussions i read all the discussions and make my comments then I go to the speed grader and I go, then I can count. Here's the students uh, 
original response and have they done two or three whatever i say for that week or that lesson responses to somebody then i can give a grade so i've so th this is great um there are some questions really the principle of what's being asked is what are some good workflows to work around the canvas shortcomings and or <laughs> uh things regarding the user interface and experience and that's what i've done um brother harris in the past is, is exactly uh, what danny dean said was was i've had sometimes just because of the nature of the tool i just had to have two windows open and i'm going through one and then using this as kind of my grade book that's a suggestion as far as far as changing the interface of canvas that's not something that uh anyone in this room really has the power to change but uh, I know it's just that again. I'm an IT guy, and unless you talk about features, so I've lucked out. Sometimes I've talked to vendors, and they've gotten features added in, and so. But that that may be beyond what we are asked. What we can do here. Yeah. No. Yeah. Thanks for your comment. Um. Cool. So let's just have one last scenario. Um. This one has to do with with teaching present. And then we'll open it up to a more generic uh, Q and A session. Okay, so one online teacher's approach to communication is very harsh. Having been a professional in their career, they value direct communication, but sometimes at the student's expense. Their announcement, discussions, and gradebook feedback is not given in the spirit of mercy and love, and cause students to feel bad about their work and themselves. So let's have a discussion about this one. We talked about the principles of etiquette. We talked about the principles of teaching in the Savior's way. And review those. So, what principles apply here? And if you were in this teacher's shoes, what would you do to change the manner of your communication with your students? What are some thoughts here? This is Cindy. I First, I think you have to have some empathy with your students. You have and be able to show that in how you reply to their questions um, that they have. I've had some students who are pretty open about difficulties that they've had in the past and they bring that into their answers to the um, assignments. And so when I'm grading, when my husband and I are grading their work, a lot of times we try to empathize with them in, in what they've opened up about in answering in their assignments so that they know that we really do care um, about what they're going through and how this particular principle or doctrine has affected them in what they're going through. And like you said before, as far as online etiquette, we don't, um, we shouldn't use exclamation points and all caps and just maybe use their name uh, once in a while and when you're answering it say Maddie I really empathize with what you're going through and with what you're feeling and and uh, give them that kind of feedback great thanks sister Thompson I really appreciate that um I don't know if Brother Goldhart has shared this yet, but there's a wonderful talk by Brother Webb, um, who who is is the head honcho of SNI, but uh, he gave a talk about about empathy in relation to SNI, and suggestion. Maybe we could share that talk. I'm not sure, but but you're you're right on responding with empathy and with love and assuming the best is great. What other things could we do to change the manner of this type of communication? Sister Cole, go ahead. Yeah, I hope I'm not speaking too much. I'm sorry. Um, but I've had a couple of special needs students in my classes over the last couple of years. And I think just really being aware of their capabilities, um, I'm not going to expect the same kind of answer out of one student that I would expect out of another one. And so I really think um, just getting to know them well enough to know maybe their capabilities. I have one girl, right, you know, young, young lady right now who just her answers might be a half a sentence, but I do know that that is probably her best effort. And so I think it's just important that we understand our students and know where they're coming from and what their capabilities are. And 
Also, I just think our students, every single one of them are so extremely busy. I can't believe how busy our teenagers are. So if they make any effort to, to do anything for seminary, I am grateful because I know the sacrifice that it is for them just to even put forth that effort to do that lesson. So from my end, I just feel grateful that they're doing anything versus maybe some students who aren't participating at all. Yeah, I love that. There's a paradigm shift in there between assuming that they are not doing their best work versus maybe trying to understand that this is their best work. This is what they're capable of. Now, now there is a there is a balance there, I will say too, because one of the roles of our teachers is to invite diligent learning. So if you understand more about the student, you've gotten to know the student and you do know that it isn't the best work, you still can make invitations to help to improve the level of effort that they're putting into to the level of effort and thought they're putting into it but not at the expense of the students themselves, right? So there's a balance there. Excellent, thanks, Mr. Fultz. All right, brothers and sisters, um, that, uh, that's it as far as the presentation. We've already done this a little bit, but I am happy to take a couple of minutes, however long um, Brother Goldhart has for, for answering a couple of questions uh, in relation to this topic with uh, establishing teacher presence. Use me, abuse me. What do you got? Yes, I got it. I got some answers. And sometimes the answer will be no, but that's okay. Distraction. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I've got a couple questions in that um, I have a lot of kids in my or youth in my seminary class who are on there because their schedule is so packed that they probably have maybe four hours to sleep tonight. How do I even get them to engage in seminary, um, the online program, during these times where they're in football and basketball or whatever sport they're in that's demanding four or five hours a day? on top of school. Yeah, so the question is more about student engagement. When we have students that are so busy, how can we encourage them to engage in seminary since they may not even have time to sleep or eat? Um, interesting. Uh, I'm gonna pitch this over to Brother Goldhart. I have some thoughts, but I'll, I'll have him uh, respond first. I think that there's, um... This is, this is not just a seminary thing. I think this is, is relevant to Institute as well because we have students that are, they're piling on all these things. And so the question really is, is, is it relevant? Is what, what they're learning relevant? Because the truth is, I mean, let's, let's be completely real. Um, if seminary or Institute doesn't really matter, they're just doing it to, to check a box, there's nothing we can do that's going to change overnight, right? So somehow we've got to be able to allow an experience to take place so that the Holy Ghost can bear witness to them that what they're studying is actually helping them solve a problem, answer a question, um, give them hope, which is probably the most significant one. Because that's the whole purpose of the, the objective of understanding and relying on the atonement of Jesus Christ. So what I've learned, Sister Erickson, is that's something that takes a little bit more one-on-one -on -one where you're going to have to have conversations with that student and to discover what do they need and can the gospel help them with that need. I know it does and you know it does, but they don't yet. Because... Once they catch that fire, once they can feel the flame of the spirit, it's hard to extinguish because they, it's infectious. And they've got to be able to feel that and see that from your, your heart and testimony. And I, I love that about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I think it's going to be an individual take time <laughs> kind of thing. That, that would be my perspective, um, Brother Barson. Yeah, I actually don't have anything to add. Uh, you mentioned what I was going to say. I think it, I think that is really a one-on-one -on -one thing for them. 
um, that you'll have to spend a little extra time as much as, as cause we all have extra time, right? Can but I, trying to determine what they can. Can I put brother um, Cunningham on the spot? And I, I apologize, Chris, cause you're, <laughs> I don't like to do this often, but I think that Chris had an experience um, with a, a student that he shared with, with Josh and I, that I think is a relevant reality check of how that works. Chris, can you can you share with us what happened and how the Spirit used you to help me now make not only Institute but the church and prophets and the proclamation relevant to someone who didn't think so? Well, it was in response to a uh, one of the questions um, that um, had the student reading the family proclamation. Uh, her her response to me was, "I'm not going to read it." because reading it in the past uh, resulted in many years of, of uh, not coming to church anymore. In fact, decades, She's a, she was an older sister. Um, and the reason being is that she was a single mom and it uh, caused her to feel as though she wasn't included in the family proclamation. And so she had a sort of a keep it away from me sort of attitude because she was going back to church now and she was engaged here in Institute. And she said, uh, she said she wasn't gonna let that happen again to her. She's gonna do everything she can to keep that from happening again. And so um, I reached out to her um, and it was through prayer and through, through uh, pondering what to do. And I shared, just simply shared with her my story of my mother raising four kids and joining the church and um, how her, her attitude, my mom's attitude was my relationship with Heavenly Father is, is between me and Heavenly Father. And um, that my mother had a way of pointing things out that seemed to be obvious to, to uh, would be obvious to anyone. It's sort of hiding in plain sight. And I showed her in the in the friendly proclamation where it said other circumstances may apply, and everyone's situation is different. Basically, I, I'm not obviously quoting it exactly, but uh, that I hoped and prayed that she would be able to to read that um, part of the the family proclamation um, in the future and find herself within it, and how none of us can go through the family proclamation sort of check everything off like done that done that done that i'm perfect um none of us can do that and so um she uh, uh responded back to me saying that she was able to read it and for the first time in in 30 i guess uh, about 30 some years she was able to uh see herself in the family proclamation and was very appreciative of that and was able to um uh, feel better about doing the lesson, <laughs> which after reading all the details of the message, of course, I'm doing this for brevity, but um, she was able to, you know, felt more comfortable about doing the lesson. And it just seems so, so little compared to what was really at stake here. Um, and, and of course, confirming to her that I loved her dearly as my student and her heavenly father and Jesus Christ was proud of her for um going back to church and and uh pushing forward even though she felt uncomfortable about the family proclamation thanks chris uh, i i might also add um i added um in the chat there uh, there's a great video about priorities um that the church put out and um it really just answers that question that um, I forget which sister had it. Sister Erickson, did you? I think you were the one. Um, yeah. it, it's great on on showing students um, what happens with priorities. It's an excellent video, excellent video, Thank and you. how to put seminary and I guess institute to uh, top of your list of priorities. Thank you. Okay, we've got one last hand, uh, Sister Allen. Um, See what we can do in the last two minutes and have one final thought for you. Oh, okay. I, I can make it a minute for you. Perfect. <laughs> so I have the, the same issue, kids that are way too busy. And I just wanted to share a quote from President Nelson. 
He says, I promise you that as you consistently give the Lord a generous portion of your time, he will multiply the remainder. And in our lesson about Isaiah, um, Isaiah says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And I just, you know, I tell my kids, you want to spend your time on things that are worth it. You don't want to spend your time on something that's not going to give you anything in return. Um, and if we put the Lord first consistently in our lives, he will multiply the rest of your time. And I just challenge them to do that, even though they are too busy. Give Heavenly Father your to-do list. Give him your to-do list, put him first, and you will have enough time. Thank you so much for that thought. I'm going to flip that. The same is true for teachers. Uh, for many of you, this is yes. your assignment. This is your calling. And prioritizing those things that are important, such as uh, helping students to understand and rely upon the atonement of Jesus Christ and build their testimony upon him. Uh, this is literally the work of salvation that we're engaged in. And there are a few things more important than that. Dare I say none? So, so as we're working on the, as, as you work to incorporate these principles of, of teacher presence in the online classroom and Canvas specifically, consider that that thought that Sister Allen beautifully shared with us too. So, my challenge for you, I have one invitation, and I'll let Brother Goldhart do with this how, whatever you want. But I have one invitation for you. We listed several things. Uh, six practices, I believe, and then some other principles of etiquette. Um, you know yourself best, um, Brother Goldhart and the people that work with him uh, can help them mentor. Uh, if you have any questions or further further clarifications on how to implement some of these within your unique situation. But my invitation to you is that just choose one thing uh, that you could implement tonight or tomorrow into your online classroom right away, whether that be posting an announcement whether being in that dusty discussion board that hasn't been visited in a while in your course, whether that's sending a message to your student somehow, and, and maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one message saying, just want to check in, how are you doing? Got this question. Maybe you've got a backlog of questions in your inbox um, that have gone and answered for a little while. Um, take the time to say, totally hear you. I'll, I'm, I'll let you know as soon as I can. Just choose one thing from these practices. Um, that's all. And then work with Brother Goldhart and uh and see how how that changes the attitudes and, and opinions of um and the atmosphere of the students in the class just want i if i can i just want to leave with my testimony i've shared bits of it already um but but this is the work of salvation uh the brethren are are i heard elder holland say fairly recently that dare i i think this is his words there is a, a quarter or a third of the attention of the brethren is focused on the youth and young adults of the church. It's very present in their mind. And uh, you wonderful teachers are on the front line helping uh, our, our, our precious youth and young adults. So thank you so much. Um, and I just leave these thoughts with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.